Yeah. All right. We're going to go ahead and begin. I want to welcome everyone uh, tonight to uh, Father's Arms Fellowship. Pastor Ken is out. Pastor Nancy is ill. So he is with her. And he's also taking care of his mother. And uh, so we just want to keep him in prayer. And we want to bless our lesson tonight. Uh, lesson 10 in the series of James. Shunning the sins in good standing. So let's go ahead and go to, go to the Lord Father in the name of Jesus Christ, your precious Son. I just want to thank you uh, for this opportunity to uh, worship you in Bible study tonight. Thank you for this great day that you've given us. Watch over us and protect us and bless this lesson. In Jesus' name, amen. <coughs> well, all right. Um, we're always going to start, of course, when we're in our New Testament by Johnny Cash reading Acts. Or, or actually reading the book of James, chapter 4. So here we go. Well, first of all, you got to turn it on, and then hit the button, and there it goes. Chapter 4. Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure and war in your members? You lust and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight in war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive, because you ask amiss, that you may spend it on your pleasures. Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever, therefore, wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously? But he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your heart, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. Do not speak evil of one another, brethren. He who speaks evil of a brother and judges his brother speaks evil of the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law but a judge. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who are you to judge another? Come now, you who say, Today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city. Spend a year there, buy and sell, and make a profit. Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, If the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. But now you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. All right. Well, sin is more subtle than most of us realize. You know, so far uh, in the chapter, James dealt with the sins of envy and lust and quarreling and friendship with the world, which we talked about last week and then we brought up a little bit this morning. Uh, also, James now is denouncing two Things most of us do without even realizing that they are serious sins. Pastor Tommy Heigl calls them sins in good standing. And as we continue this journey into faith that works, we need to shun these sins in good standing. So let's discover how, all right? So the first one is abstain from gossip. Well, James addresses this sin by writing, Brothers, do not slander one another. Now, that word translated slander is speak not evil, or it basically means to speak against, and it refers to gospel, the, go the gossip, rather, as, as basically character assassination. 
Uh, it, this command forbids us to gossip or talk about other people in ways that damage their reputation. Now, slander is purely satanic because the word translated devil in the New Testament is diabolos. And that means slanderer. So this is what the devil is called in Revelation 12, verse 10. It says, Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now I have come the salvation, now I have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his anointed one. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters, the one who accuses them before our God day and night, has been thrown out. So as we said a minute ago, <coughs> excuse me, all slander and gossip originates with the devil. And so when we listen or pass on gossip, we're in essence doing the work of the devil. And uh, gossip is a favorite pastime of many believers. It becomes one of the most uh, difficult temptations to resist. And as Will Rogers once said, the only time that people dislike gossip is when you talk or when you gossip about them. And so when you look at Proverbs 18, verse 8, it says, The words of a gossip are tasty morsels going down into one one's innermost being. It means basically that gossip is like, excuse me, like tasty tidbits that are swallowed up and stored in our innermost parts so they can be later shared for evil purposes of spreading rumors. Now, many believers think it's okay to share the personal affairs or downfalls of other people as long as the information is true. Uh, however, unless it's shared to protect someone or help someone, it's a diabolic sin of slander or gossip. Of course, a lot of times, as believers, they won't go to someone and say, um, did you hear about so-and-so? Now, what they say is, well, we really need to pray for so-and-so because of this and this and this and this. <laughs> All right, so as, as goofy as that is, Christians are no different than non-Christians when it comes to gossip. And the bottom line is we really need to stay away from that because it hurts the body. It never helps the body. It always hurts the body of believers. And it's just something that we need to we need to just not do. Uh, I'm getting, and the older I get, the more I'm just saying, you know what, I just don't need this. It's just not important. And if you want to sit and talk about somebody, I'm just going to walk away. And I usually do. I just don't want to hear it. it just, it's just not Anymore, it is just not important. And James goes on to say, he says, Anyone who speaks against his brother or judges him speaks against the law and judges it. He goes on to say, When you judge the law, you're not keeping it, but sitting in judgment on it. In other words, we attack, when we attack the law when we gossip or slander. And it's a serious sin because it violates the second greatest commandment and fundamental law of human relationships. Well, what do I mean by that? Let me get a drink here real quick. It boils down, look what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 22. <clears throat> and he said to him, You shall love Adonai your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. And the second it's like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. That's what James calls the royal law. And uh wife is getting some hey tags, hold on. Alright, anyway. Um sorry about that. James calls that the royal law. And when we're knowingly and willfully are guilty of not keeping God's law, we're sitting in judgment on it. Having determined it is not worthy to be obeyed. That's basically how we look at it. And most of us would agree that slander and gossip is wrong. But we wouldn't think of it as horribly evil. 
that that is not right. James, who's under the inspiration of God here, the Holy Spirit of God here, says that gossip and slander are horrible evils because when we practice them, we put ourselves above God's number one law in human relationships, which is loving our neighbor as ourselves. Hmm. To me, that's pretty cut and dry. Only God has the right to modify and overrule a divine law. That's why James writes in verse 12, there's only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. Only God has the right to judge because he's both the source and the enforcer of the law. All right? He rewards those who obey it. He punishes those who don't. That's pretty cut and dry, too. But James then goes on to ask, but you, who are you to judge your neighbor? Well, the answer here is quite obvious. When we judge others, we set ourselves up as God when we're judging them, when we gossip about them. The Bible teaches gossip is a sin of utmost serious because it violates the second greatest commandment. What got me and and like anymore, I'm being real careful. I'm like, I just, I just pray, Lord, you know, don't let me be, don't let me judge somebody, and help me to not say anything stupid. And, and the reason why I say that, because when I look at Matthew chapter 12, here verse uh, 36 and 37, but I tell you, on that day of judgment, men will give account for er every careless word they speak. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. And that's why I heard that right there really got to me. And because I know I said so many careless words in my life. And I'm going to have to give an account for it. Amen. And uh, so I, I, I'm still guilty. More than likely, although I'm really trying to not be that way because uh, I don't want to be I don't want to be judged for the words. Also, um, a lot of times, though, I, I'm really blessed when I do share some of my thoughts with my wife that she is a very good she she is very what sort of looking for she is very good. To correct me if I'm about to do something stupid. Mm. So sometimes those uh, those intimate relationships really help you because that way mm. we're not doing anything stupid, right? Uh, so to shun sins of good standing, we need to abstain from gossip. Mm. And but there's something else that James tells us we need to do, and that is. Avoid presumptuous planning. Now, James here is talking about the sin of planning presumptuously. He illustrates it with a conversation between business people where he says, Ah, well, today or tomorrow we'll go to this city, we'll spend a year there, and we'll carry on business and make money. Well, now, on the surface, on the surface, that didn't sound too bad. Right? Uh, the problem is, the point about it is, God is left out of the planning. And I brought this up a little bit this morning. Many Christians, I like what Tommy Heigl says here, he says, many Christians are practical atheists because they make decisions and plans as though God doesn't exist. <coughs> James says, if we are to let God in on every area of our lives, including our jobs, investments, and careers. Well, wait, what? <clears throat> when you look at Proverbs 21 and Luke chapter 14, God wants us to plan and count the cost. <clears throat> Excuse me. But not to exclude him from the process. It's a serious sin to exclude God from our plans. We do it every day. 
We do it every day. Instead of keeping God out of our plans, here's what Proverbs 16, verse 3 tells us to do. Commit whatever you do to God or to Adonai, and your plans will succeed. Isn't it amazing? And we all honestly have stories where we've asked God for help on something that we thought we'd like to do, and he told us either no, because they had something better, or go ahead and do it this way, and it always succeeds when we do it his way, right? I didn't say it was easy, but it succeeds, correct? You know, in reality, making plans without God is presumptuous because none of us, according to James 14, we don't even know what's going to happen tomorrow. Even, even Jesus said, you know, don't worry about tomorrow. The problems of today are enough for today, right? Amen. Yeah, and so, you know, that, you know, we got to be careful. We don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. We don't know what's going to happen five years from now. James is not suggesting that we sh that we should not make any plans. Not at all. But we need to be realistic and understand that the future is uncertain, so we need to depend on God, according to Proverbs 27, verse 1. So to help put things in perspective as we plan, James says we must remember that our lives are just a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Our lives are like a mist or fog early in the morning that is quickly burned off by the sun. Therefore, we shouldn't be like the rich farmer who, whose crops produce so bountifully, he says to himself, uh, I'm just going to build bigger barns and just eat, drink, and be merry for the rest of my life. God says to him something quite different in Luke 16, or Luke 12, excuse me. God said to him, you fool, tonight your soul is being demanded back from you, and what have you prepared? Whose will that be? There's two letters in the middle of the word life, and they spell if, because life is so iffy, Right? We shouldn't deceive ourselves into thinking that we have plenty of time to enjoy our family or to live for Christ. Our lives are like a mist that has no permanence. Go to any graveyard, you see names, most of them you do not know. Some you might because if they're family or friends or something like that. And of course, you know, we do have our famous people, but for the most part, every one of us every day are just... We're here one day, and we're gone tomorrow. And it happens quickly, and then we'll, just everything that everything that we've ever done, it really, it gets forgotten. A lot of it does. Our lives are like a mist, and has no permanence. And First Samuel 20, chapter twenty, verse three, it reminds us of this, of the, what we call the brevity of life. David swore against saying. Your father knows very well that I have found favor in your eyes. He's talking to Jonathan here. So he must have thought, let's, let's not let Jonathan know about this or else he'll be grieved. But truly as Adonai, Adonai lives and your soul lives, there is but a step between me and death. In other words, we're only one heartbeat away from eternity. And we shouldn't take tomorrow or even today for granted. So if we ignore God when we plan, we should say, or instead of ignoring God, we should say if the Lord wills, we'll live and do this or that, according to James 15, verse 15 there in chapter 4. Go ahead and make plans, but put God in the middle of those plans. And and you can, you know, it's a it's an attitude of understanding, especially when you look at the truth. In the Proverbs 16, verse 9, it says, The heart of a man plans his course, but Adonai, or God, directs his steps. If we allow room for God's will in our plans, there is such a wonderful balance between our plans and God's oversight of the outcome. And our plans must always adjust to God's will 
and not be in conflict. And James continues, he says, As it is, you boast and brag, all such boasting is evil. In other words, bragging about our presumptuous plans is evil because we act as though we can control our own destinies without God's help. Boy, is that dumb. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I know when we just got through remodeling our house, Mike, Mike did the work. And when we, when we started doing it, you know, we, Kim and I had kind of grand plans of what we wanted to do. I mean, we knew some things had to be done to it, but we, we kind of had this idea that we were just going to do something really, you know, I almost say outrageous. And then Mike got into fixing Miles' floor, and we found out that the, the floor joists, some of them were rotten out. And then we, then we were like, okay, you know, we knew we knew that we could we could fix Miles' floor. We had basically took my retirement out, and that's what we used to uh, my pastor retirement because we were losing money like crazy, and uh, put it in on something that we can invest in something that's going to last. And when Mike got into the floor in his room, we found some of the joists were rotten out. And at that point, we were like, okay, now what do we do? You know, and do we, do we stop? Do we continue? Do we scale back? Do we sell? I mean, had all these voices in our head. And we started looking at different houses. And cape and all that. We find a couple of it. It just was not. It just wasn't right. Um, we know that God brought us to where we're at on top of the hill there in Elmo for a reason. And we kind of forgot that. But we're like, you know what? Before we go any farther, before we plan any farther, we're going to pray to see what um, what to do. We knew God gave us the authority to, to take that money out and to work on the house. That much we knew. And so, but we were really, uh, we were really struggling in what to do. And this is when I was still working for the city of Cape, driving the trash truck. And the Holy Spirit brings to me, brings this to mind, and he told us exactly what we were to do with the house. And we did that. We uh, put some. We we fixed up. Got the front porch fixed. Got new gutters all around. Put a new roof on the garage. Uh, we ended up having to buy some appliances, and God directed all of it, and He provided for all of it, and, uh, and He was very specific on what we were to do. We were able to do that. And there was such peace when that happened because, because God directed the plans that he wanted us to do. And Mike did Mike did an awesome job. He's got one more thing he has to do on it, which he'll hopefully get to it, not this week, but next week. And then that's that's some, that's something that I want, kind of. And uh, we're going to trust the Lord, and we'll, we'll see what happens there. But I, I have to tell you... Um, when the Holy Spirit directed us into doing what we were supposed to do, there was such a peace because we knew God's plans were in Miles. What are you doing? All right, go go in the go in the other bathroom in there. Turn turn that light on. Sorry, folks. Sorry, Facebook. Okay. Right, it happens. This is this is what happens. This is what happens when you have an autistic child. This is just kind of the way it is. So, James concludes the section by writing, Anyone then who knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it, sins. In other words, we know that we need to include God in our plans, and when we don't, we sin. And, you know, as I brought out this morning, a lot of times when we make plans 
and not put God in the middle of it, we end up getting the second best. When God wants to give us his very best, but he wants He wants to be involved in it. And so um, it indicates that not only, it indicates that sin is not only doing what is wrong, it's also not as doing what is right. In other words, there's two kinds of sin. The sins of commission and omission. For example, gossip is the sin of commission. While not giving a needed word of encouragement or sharing the good news or just being there to pray for someone is the sin of omission. And failing to give encouragement is a sin because it, it violates the commandment in 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 11 that says, Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up just as in fact you are doing. Listen, if God gives us the opportunity to do a kind act, to give an encouraging word, to be a peacemaker or whatever it is he wants us to do, if we fail to do it, we have sinned. And any time we fail to do good, we sin, because you can look right, right at Galatians 6, verse 10. Therefore, whenever we have an opportunity, let us do good towards all, especially those who belong to the household of faith. We need to look at every opportunity in our lives to do good as being strategically placed by God for such a time as this, just like Esther in the Old, in the Old Testament. Our journey into what we call a faith that works is not so much what we don't do, such as avoiding sin, but what we do, what we do by doing good. And so when we shun the sins of in good standing, we need to abstain from gossip and we need to avoid presumptuous planning. And so when we get in these two areas today, just think about it and see what God would have us to do. And um uh, Just trust that when we put God first in everything, we're going to get the very best. It will last. And one day, I personally just want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. And as long as we do that, I think we'll be okay. Yeah. Well, Father, I thank you so much for this lesson. I know it's, it's a little short, and things have been crazy. We do want to lift up Pastor Nancy, who's ill. Uh, today. We also want to lift up Pastor Kent's mom. Uh, she's in the hospital, I believe, and she's not doing very well. And uh, because of that, we didn't, uh, of course, sing tonight or anything like that, but that's all right, Lord. Uh, I just want to thank those who came tonight. I ask that you send a special blessing uh, their way. I pray, Lord, as, it was bad as we continue in the book of James, that um, you will teach us some valuable lessons. We thank you so much, Heavenly Father, for loving us and caring for us and just filling us with your spirit. Thank you, Jesus, so much for being an awesome and mighty God. And we praise your holy name. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, all right, next week we'll be in chapter 5. So have a good evening, and we'll see you next time. And so I'm going to walk over here and turn this off, and y'all have a good night. Uh-oh. What? Uh-oh. Sorry. Your snack? Oh.